Hello listeners, welcome back to Luke's English Podcast. Just in case you don't know, this is a podcast for learners of English and one of my aims for these episodes is to help you get more listening practice into your everyday life because listening to plenty of English, natural spoken English, I think is a really important part of the process of learning this language. And so I want to help you to listen to more English for longer periods of time on a regular basis, long term. That's the idea. So this episode today is uh, a conversation episode. That means I'll be in conversation with a guest. So let me tell you about my guest today. So today I'm talking to my friend Charles Pellegrin. Uh, Charles is uh, a journalist actually. He works for the news station France 24, which is a 24 hour news station. They have um, news in English, in French, in Spanish and in Arabic. Anyway, Charles uh, is a reporter and a news presenter for France 24. But I know Charles from doing stand-up comedy in Paris because uh, Charles also, uh, in the evenings, does stand-up comedy in English. And so that's how I know Charles. I met him doing shows and I've known him for a few years now. In fact, Charles is the guy that I'm doing this stand-up comedy show with on the 19th of July, which is very soon. I think I'm publishing this like the Tuesday and the show is on the Friday. So there's still a little bit of time uh, for you to decide to come if you're in the Paris area. I know that most people listening to this are not in the area, so you can't really come. So sorry for those of you. Hopefully uh, on Friday evening, uh, after the comedy, I'll be able to record a podcast in the room. That's the plan. So you should be able to get something uh, from the from the, the evening, even if you can't actually come to the room. Uh, but if you are in the Paris area, let me just remind you of the details. So the show is called Same Difference. Uh, Charles Pellegrin, me, Luke Thompson. The date is July the 19th, uh, 2024, 8.30pm. The venue is called Au Soleil de la Butte, 32 Rue Muller in the 18th arrondissement of Paris. Uh, it's free. It's a free show. And if you want to reserve a seat in the room, then you can do that. Just follow the link that you'll find in the description. And reserving your seat is free as well. Now, we don't actually know how many people are going to come to this. Uh, it's, I mean, it's possible. Since I've been talking about it on the podcast quite regularly, it's possible, I suppose, that we'll get a completely full room. Uh, but you know, I don't really know. Uh, uh, I've got, as you know, I've got a lot of ninjas who listen to this podcast, um, and I can't always predict what they'll be doing. They might just decide to hide in the shadows and not actually come to the show, or maybe we'll get a full room. Now, um, if you've reserved a seat using the link I mentioned, if you've already reserved your seat, but it turns out you can't come to the show, then please cancel your reservation because there's a chance that the room will be full and we wouldn't want to hold seats for people who are not coming, right? So if you can't come and you've reserved, please cancel your reservation. Again, following the link uh, in the description. Um, and maybe I, I would suggest maybe if you are coming, try and come a little bit early in order to avoid disappointment because if the room is completely packed and I mean, I, 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 I doubt that we will have no space, but you never know. So in any case, uh, it's better to be safe than sorry. So come early um, in order to be sure that you'll get a seat. Also, I should let you know that in the same room at 7 p.m., there's an open mic night, an open mic comedy night in English. So you could come for that as well and then just stay um, and you'll be able to see uh, the show at 8.30. And then after that, I'll be doing my podcast recording. Um, at the venue, Au Soleil de la Butte, obviously you can get drinks, but you can get food as well. They sell pizzas and stuff. So you could eat there as well if you want. Um, okay, so there you go. I thought I'd just remind you of that. Uh, 8.30, 19th of July, 2024, Au Soleil de la Butte uh, for the comedy show and stick around for the op for the uh, podcast recording as well. And of course, there's the open mic night at 7pm uh, beforehand. Follow the link in the description for the details. Right. So back to Charles Pellegrin, my guest in today's episode. So Charles is an interesting person to talk to for a number of reasons. 
Um, let's see. First of all, he's bilingual. He's completely bilingual between French and English, which is always an interesting thing for me. I love to talk to multilingual people to find out basically the, the nature of their bilingualism, the story of it, how it happened, uh, whether there is a difference for them between, you know, the, the different languages that they have. Um, we also are going to talk about his work as a journalist, of course. Uh, we start by talking about the ways that uh, news readers and reporters speak when they read the news or do their reports in English. This is one of the things I like to talk about in my stand-up. And so um, I talk to Charles about that. And we talk about the, the ways that um, news reporting, uh, the conventions of news reporting, the way that they influence the way that the English is used... So that's the way that news readers and reporters speak. We we talk about how Charles got started in journalism, what he did at university and beyond. We talk about how news reports are made, how they're actually done, and the challenges of getting it right and and squeezing everything into a certain amount of time and how you've got to adapt your English for it and so on. We talk about the Paris Olympics because obviously the Olympics are taking place in Paris uh, in this year, this summer, and so we talk about that. Uh, it, will the Olympics be good for France or will they not be good for France? Are they going to help the economy or not? Um, and another interesting thing about Charles is that he used to live and work in China. He spent three years in Beijing working as a journalist for mostly providing news reports for France 24, working as a kind of Chinese correspondent for them. So we talk about his experience of living in China for three years, the kind of everyday cultural differences, and also uh, what it's like to work as a journalist for a, you know, for a Western news outlet in China and what that's like and the kind of complications and the way that the sort of the, the, the political situation is involved in it. So um, I think it's a very interesting conversation. I hope you agree. I hope you find it interesting, entertaining and engaging. Uh, stick around until the end. I'll ramble to you a little bit more, but I think now it's time to start the conversation. So let's get started and here we go. Hello, Charles. Welcome to this room, which I call my pod room, which is in this pod castle. It's not actually a castle, of course. It's a building. Well, it's just one room. I don't know how much of a castle it is if it's just one so room. So, no, the whole building feels a bit like a castle when you look out uh, the window and you see these sort of, like, towers, which are actually chimneys. So, it's not a castle no, at all. It's you're not. really... <laughs> you're stretched. grasping at straws here. <laughs> a little bit. Anyway, welcome onto my podcast. Thanks, Luke. So, maybe a good way to begin. This is sometimes how I start when I've got, like... Um, guests on friends and stuff I, I ask people how we know each other mm -hmm. so how do we know each other i think we probably we met uh via um, through through play, performing stand-up in paris in english mm -hmm. uh i think i started about 10 years ago you started much long before that a longer it's been a longer time i think yeah i you. think so yeah but yeah. i think i saw you i remember seeing you as an audience member Oh yeah, uh, yeah, and then meeting you later once I started doing stand up myself. What did you What did you see me doing? Do you remember? Uh, so it was at Pan Am in the 11th arrondissement, and yeah. you. I remember you did a, a really funny uh, bit about um, newscaster voices and and like the different types of BBC voices there. There's the in studio voice, the out of studio voice, and you're just very good at, at doing it. And, uh, and the, the crowd was really enjoying it. And the sense of urgency of the of the reporter who's outside the comfort of the studio that really struck a struck a chord with me. Yeah. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly it was much more high pitched and yeah, there was just a, a sense of alarm. That was interesting. Mm. So I don't know if my audience might be familiar with that. There is a video of me doing that on, okay. on YouTube. Um, but it's the kind of thing I do in stand up is like kind of copying the voices of news readers in different situations in the studio and outside. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, as a journalist yourself and someone who reads the news, did that I mean, did that strike you as being kind of true, accurate? Do, do, uh, do Have you noticed a certain uh way that news readers speak do they have a kind of oh, typical way for of speaking? sure for sure um well the thing that the 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 good part about your bit was that i hadn't thought about it before and you just sort of unveiled this reality to me and it really struck a chord and that's why i was i was laughing so much but then mm. um not necessarily about the way we speak but the different types of, of speech there are within journalism but you know there's definitely um, in English language journalism and in French language journalism, there's a way that to, of speaking that's almost not natural, mm -hmm. but it's. Um, I think it's uh, something that we do as a way to be clear. 
and to be intelligible to different from pe to, to people from different backgrounds mm. and with different accents. Yeah. Uh, um, unfortunately, that can be also alienating for some people. I think in French, for example, French uh, journalism, French TV journalism has an incredible, like a very sort of an overbearing majority of Parisian accents. And there's not much space for people with an accent from the south of France or from other parts of the country. And, uh, and there's not much... Uh, uh, sort of a tolerance for it, which is too bad. Maybe these things cha are, are changing a bit faster in other in Anglo Ang Anglophone countries in, in the U.S. Definitely, or you know, I think in the in the U.K. you start hearing different kinds of accents. Uh, yeah, it's coming in a little bit. Mm. Uh, but um, so reading the news, the main news, sort mm -hmm. of like the the main news show, the national news at sort of 10 p.m. or 6 p.m. It's still, you still don't hear that many regional accents in the news. There's still a kind of standard BBC voice. Mm. Although having said that, we did have um, a Welsh news reader who had a bit of a Welsh accent. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, it's still a sort of standard BBC yeah. sort of received pronunciation. Right. But little by little, it's, you know, uh, regional accents are coming in. Mm. But for, for less formal shows, like the more informal right. sort of magazine style programs, uh, like there's a show called The One Show. Um, which are kind of like, you know, uh, yeah, a magazine style program, which basically means kind of like more human interest stories, more informal interviews. They sit on sofas, mm -hmm. they, you know, uh, then definitely regional accents are, uh, you know, uh, the most common thing that you get. Like you, in fact, you have to have a regional accent, it seems. So there's like someone with a Newcastle accent, a Welsh accent, you know, definitely mm -hmm. very much so. Um, so in my bit that you're talking about on stage where I copy uh, the way that newsreaders speak, I think it's particularly British uh, newsreaders. I say it's the BBC, but it's really anyone with a kind of English accent who does it. Because I was listening to France 24 this morning, um, and I'm going to have to do an introduction, I think, to this episode to explain you know, the, who you are, yeah. basically, and that you, you read the news on France 24. So I was, I was watching your show, is it People and Profits? Is that what it's called? That's the, yeah, the, the weekly sort of business and economics uh, show that we have on France 24 English that I'm currently hosting uh, as a replacement to Kate Moody, who's on maternity leave. Okay. Yeah. So I was, I was listening to that, and, and there were sort of uh, reports from different reporters and uh, most of them had American accents, but then whenever there was a British one, it was like totally the British <laughs> news voice. So I don't know what the story could be. It would be like, you know, uh, um, I don't know, give me a, a story idea. I think idea. it was about uh, the sort of the success story of the Swedish video gaming industry. Yes. And that, and that was Cammie Knight, who's British and a very good uh, reporter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and she has that sort of... Uh, perfect BBC intonation and accent uh, especially it's I think more than the accent it's the intonation of how to <laughs> how to put a sentence together and go up and down and especially at the end of the story you have to finish like this yeah you know? yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes specifically English one I don't mean to kind of make fun of uh, Kate is that her name but like all English news readers do it or reporters do it and it's kind of like the very specific intonation pattern which you only hear on the news it's like in no other yeah. situation do you hear this mm -hmm. so the story would let's say the story is about if you just give me like a made-up story i don't know what okay. could it be uh a bear mauled um i don't know the prime minister of canada go on okay so political meetings in canada <laughs> usually you know political meetings in canada normally take place in a boring office environment but last week uh, amid plans for i don't know you know, <laughs> last <laughs> last week amid plans to rejuvenate the uh, political uh, meeting, the, the world of political meetings, the president, the prime minister's meeting took place in a forest. Right. Uh, you know, so that kind of. And thing. that's where it all went wrong. Like, yeah, that's yeah, more yeah. like American, I it feels so, like. Yeah. And that's where it all went wrong. <laughs> you know, like the American one sounds like kind of like. Uh, um, like a trailer uh, for a staging movie. a meeting in a forest for a prime minister of any country is a rare occasion. <laughs> uh, but for uh, the prime minister of Canada recently, taking uh, having a meeting in a forest is where it all went wrong. Whereas in in England, it would be like uh, uh, deciding to conduct a meeting in a forest is where uh, everything went wrong. So da -da 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 -da, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, very specific, but just kind of. 
But I think there's a way of like, uh, as opposed to, you know, in conversation or people talking normally, there's a sense of you, you tend to finish sentences and then start again. But like, in a, especially if you're a package producer and you're putting your voice on an edited bit of video, not mm. if you necessarily, because there's a difference. There's a presenter voice and then there's the reporter uh, putting a package together out of, you know, footage that he shot on the ground and where you don't see his face. And that's a whole different exercise. And that's where you don't want to go down until the end of the story. So that's why, it's like, you know, that's, I forget what the, the sentence is in this imagined scenario of the, of the bear mauling the Prime Minister of Canada. And then that's where it all went wrong. Like that's why, and that's where it all went wrong. And then you keep going on, on sort of a higher pitch until you get to land at the end. Yeah, that final... Yeah landing is just a signal this is the end of the report mm -hmm. but yeah i know it's very difficult for reporters because you go out you shoot the story often with one camera is that my phone uh, you shoot the story often with one camera and uh, maybe do a couple of interviews or something you do a piece to camera but then also you take that footage back to the studio and you quickly edit it because it's got to be on the news by the end of the day mm -hmm. you edit it together and then you have to do a voiceover you've got to write your mm -hmm. script and then you've got to put the voice out the script to the visuals and yeah. this is all done very quickly yeah yeah so it's, it's a real challenge to kind of get the information across and try to make it very clear try not to get into the world of cliches and and then to also do it within just very tight time limit and to signal to the audience this is the end of the report mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it, it forces it creates a kind of interesting very specific form of english mm -hmm. which includes things like these certain intonation patterns also it has to be presented as being informative serious mm -hmm. and so this is the sound that happens this mm -hmm. is the result of that situation right <laughs> well what's funny as well is uh working at france 24 there's so much uh, synergy with the french side of the channel and uh or the arabic side of the cha uh, of the channel we, we have a spanish sister channel as well but they work um their offices are in colombia so we don't have to deal with them too often mm. but uh, and sometimes some journalists are multilingual and are able to go from one to the other and so you'll get some interesting crossovers where where some formulations or some ways of writing are accepted in french but not in english but they'll still make their way in mm. because you know that's the way it, it works at France 24 um, and so there's some uh, for example in French sometimes what they do is um, a reporter on the ground uh, face to camera w might start by a quote by someone else like let's say you're covering a trial I think uh <laughs> I'm not going to name names. One of the funny ones that happened, um, there was a trial. I think it was a, I think it was a, um, a child molestation or something very serious or like that. And um, the reporter on the ground started with a quote by the from the accused who actually um, confessed his guilt. Uh, or confessed that he'd 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 done it, you know, and and he was he's trying to get better. And the lie turns to the reporter on the ground and he just says, "I want to be castrated." <laughs> Said the <laughs> said the man on the docket or whatever, and I but like you and like everyone. And I was like, no, you can't do that. In yeah, English. that's that's just it. Probably probably weird in French too, honestly. But um, but so yeah, talking about sort of like um <laughs> um conventions of reporting yeah. in different places, mm -hmm. and that maybe in in sort of Spanish speaking places or in at least in Colombia, that's <laughs> perhaps a bit more conventional to start well, with a in quote. This case, in this case, this was a French reporter. It was, it was a, French a French reporter, reporter who uh, who switched to English because uh, he speaks English quite well and 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 did this live for the for the for the English channel, mm. but. Uh, but there, yeah, we probably should have checked, uh, checked the script beforehand, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's interesting that We you don't have... always have time to write scripts. That's a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. know oh, it's, it's tough, yeah. Um, but it's interesting from a sort of, from my point of view as, as an English teacher, to look at how situations create different types of English, you know, different sorts of contexts and different sort of, um, yeah, different situations, and also how conventions become important. So, you know, it's conventional in the world of news reporting to do certain things, to start your report in a certain way and to finish it in, in, in a certain way, just so that no one's surprised in the wrong way. You don't want to be surprised yeah. by something. You want, you know, if you start your report with a quote, if everyone did that, if that was like common, if that was the convention, mm, then that would be, be normal. But because it's not conventional, you can't really do that. Which is it really surprises unfair. Everyone. Which is really unfair because it's, uh, in a way, I mean, we have these conventions, but it's okay to change conventions some, sometimes. And, and after a while, conventions become 
barriers to entry. It becomes who's in the club and who's not in the club. Mm -hmm. And that's why you'll end up uh, with having a newsroom made of people who are all from the same background or all with the same education. And yeah. we probably need to be more conscious about you know, allowing for more changes or, or being a bit more lenient or tolerant of different, you know, turns of phrase when in script writing or in presenting and all that stuff. I think I think there's a lot being done on that. Obviously, it's uh, journalism is, is not as rigid as it as it used to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we, st we already started talking <laughs> about journalism, uh, starting with um, the first question, which is how do we know each other? We mm -hmm. know each other f through stand up. Mm -hmm. So y both of us do stand up in the evenings as a sort of side hustle type thing. I suppose. I don't know how much hustle there is, but you know, yeah. it's a, it's a, for me, it's a, it's a passion almost. It's something it brings me a lot of joy. Yeah, and that that's why I do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah me too, me too. Um, but that's how we know each other. But yeah. so, so oh, there's lots of things that I want to talk to you about. So in your stand up, so uh, let's let's start with um, your your background mm -hmm. and maybe your English as well, if if that's all right with you. Mm -hmm. um, in your stand up, if I can quote you, I'll start with a quote. You say, can I do that? Yeah, go on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, one of the things you say is that you're French on a technicality. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? <laughs> um, the, the, so, <laughs> the technicality uh, is that both my parents are French, um, which not a technicality, but it makes sense because I didn't grow up in France. And uh, I only moved to France for the first time to actually live here when I was an adult. I was uh, 21. Um, and so I just... I'm an expat kid, really. Uh, my my father w moved around for work a lot, and so I followed him my whole life. And I was born in London. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Matt, well, you wouldn't tell by my accent. Uh, apparently, I used to have a very sort of posh, proper British accent as a kid. Really? And I feel like I've missed an opportunity, because I feel like I'd get a lot more respect as a journalist if I didn't have this dumb, bro-y American accent. But, <laughs> um, but that's the... Uh, after. But we left Britain quite... Uh, quickly, I was three or four years old, and then we moved around a lot more. Went to Southeast Asia, Singapore, Bangkok, then to uh, South Africa. I lived in Johannesburg. That's where I was in high school, and then I went to Canada uh, for my for university for studies. Um, and not, not in a forest, hopefully. No, no, I did not. Uh, I did not uh, meet any grizzly bears. Uh, although I did have a roommate who. Was very close, very close. <laughs> <laughs> He's a very good friend of mine, and I'm sure he'd appreciate that. <laughs> Quite hairy, hibernated a lot. Uh, hibernated a lot. Uh, big, sort of roaring, booming voice. He was, a, he was, a, he was an actor. He was in, in, in plays a lot. Oh, He's yeah. very charismatic, the way bears are. <laughs> they are, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm just trying to put a positive spin on it. Yeah, you yeah. Know? <laughs> <laughs> saying, <laughs> saying quality, you know, qualities of bears: charismatic, charming, yeah, like fero that. ferocious, uh, very good at surviving. <laughs> Yeah. can beat oh, yeah. most people in a fight yeah i'd say so i'd say so not leo dicaprio we watched the revenant the other day and that's a tangent but yeah that yeah yeah <laughs> no that's a good reference though a lot of people will will have seen that leonardo dicaprio versus the bear in the in uh, how did leonardo dicaprio survive that so it's very unrealistic no, I don't. any anyway yeah we can, well, we know that bear was over 25, because then he would have let that bear do whatever he... That's the joke about DiCaprio, you know, that he... No, I don't know. He this. doesn't... This is a whole thing on the internet that... Um, DiCaprio does not date women over 25, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you mean, if the bear had been less than 25, he would have let the bear do, yes, what, do yes, what it wanted to him? Exactly. But, but he was desperate to run away from that bear, because it was <laughs> too old. <laughs> Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Um, so, all right, you, <laughs> anyway. mean, you are you technically British? Uh, technically, technically. So, you're basically, the story is your parents are both French, but you moved around a lot. You were born in the UK. Mm -hmm. Do you have a British passport? So, at the time, my parents, you know, inquired about, you know, whether I could get one, etc. And I could, but um, the thinking was just like, well, we're all part of the European Union, what's the point? so what's the point? Uh, and now it's too late, um, if I wanted to. Uh, so, I don't so, yeah. think, would you want one now, though? I mean, you know, I like to keep my options open, you yeah, know? Like, yeah, I, I yeah. like the UK, I like going there for a visit, and, you know, that there, uh, as an English-speaking reporter, maybe I'd have professional opportunities there, yeah. but it would be more complicated for me to, to, to move there now without the appropriate, you know, passport. Mm. But, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, but then your accent then. Explain <laughs> your accent. So I think, as I said, apparently I started off, this is what my parents tell me, I started off with a British accent because I, I grew up in, in the UK. But then living in Southeast Asia, I was sort of in expat-y international 
environments or you know so or there was singlish but uh I mean, I can do a bad sing- Singlish accent. And Singaporean I want- English. Singaporean Singlish. English. It's almost like a Creole, like because there's a lot of uh, of uh, local languages, like whether you know uh, Mandarin or Hokkien or some other Chinese languages, and um, any of the. It's a bit of a melting pot, Singapore, for that. So Singlish it really puts all that together in a sort of local patois. Um, and I actually like I could do a decent Singlish accent because yeah. I was watching all Singaporean TV and all that, but. I was in a French school, but where people learned English earlier than they do at French school in France. And uh, quickly, I had sort of that internationally accent that's tinged with a lot of American, just because of cultural imperialism, basically. Just, <laughs> just or, or soft power is probably a, be- a nicer word for it. Um, uh, so, so I think I'm just basically I'm the the result of this sort of American hegemony in a way. Mm. And then. It, Apparently, I, I had m- a more discernibly international accent before I moved to Canada. And in Canada, I was really in a sort of a immersed in North American culture. Uh, and, and my accent, I think, cemented into what it is currently. Okay. So this mm. is Canadian accent, is it? Well, I was, I'd say, generic north american because i was i was surrounded by americans who happened to be uh, at at the school that i was at as well as canadians and canadians from different provinces as well where there are different accents within canada mm. so i think i think it's honestly my accent is more the reflection of like yeah these conversations but also tv and movies and and just uh uh, just recreating that uh, on a on a daily basis uh, and trying to trying to stick to to that um, yeah generic North American is how I I think it, it makes most sense and I think mm-hmm. when I meet Americans or Canadians they tend to think that I'm from North America ne- not necessarily where they're from but that general area yeah it's so kind of a standard American accent yeah yeah. yeah. But I'll mess up sometimes, and I'll uh, you know I'll say some weird thing that kind of uh, that's a tell. And my wife, who's Australian, likes pointing these out. Or sometimes maybe I'm tired and I forget a word. Uh, like uh, I think one day I called a pinky toe. I called it a tiny toe. Pinky toe, listeners. It's basically the little toe. It's the littlest, littlest toe on the foot. Yeah. Because yeah. like, uh, if, <laughs> if we talk quickly, if we do like a mini lesson about uh, um, the, the vocabulary of the hands and feet. So in the UK, thumb, uh, index finger, middle finger, ring finger, and little finger. Mm-hmm. And on, the, on your foot, it's big toe and just other toes mm-hmm. and then little toe. Mm-hmm. But in American English, thumb... Index finger, I guess. Mm-hmm. Middle finger, ring finger, pinky, pinky, and pinky toe. Yeah, but I guess she's Australian, so she would have said little toe. But I said tiny toe, which apparently is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> and she won't let me fucking. <laughs> sorry. Can I swear on this podcast? Yeah, you can swear. Okay. It's fine. Well, she won't fucking let me go. <laughs> right. About yeah, it. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's. I guess she always brings it up and has a good laugh about it. Mm. Okay, but that's so that's like a little uh, indication. Yeah. That a tell. Yeah. That, yeah. that you've got a slightly more complex uh, journey mm. in terms of your English and it might be there might be other yeah. diverse influences in there yeah another one is uh and this this makes no sense and i know what it is but sometimes i'm tired and i say it as like i uh, you know i put my pants in the pantry <laughs> Cause, cause, and i was like what wait a minute you put, <laughs> when you say you put your pants in the pantry what what is what do you I'm mean by the pantry the, i'm thinking the wardrobe the wardrobe right or the, the closet yeah well, you, the, you open yeah. the drawer put yeah. the pants in or open the cupboard or wardrobe and put the pants on yeah. the shelf not a cupboard something. Not a cupboard. Well, because that's where you put cups. Cupboards, yes. This sort of thing is a cupboard, but yeah. a wardrobe, yes, yeah. is much, much larger, yeah. yeah. Cupboard, 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 uh, cupboard, wardrobe. Yeah, I'm just imagining a situation where you might have a cupboard with clothes in it. But anyway, generally speaking, yes, cupboards in the kitchen mm. where you put your your, your cutlery and, st- and your crockery. Mm-hmm. And then wardrobe is the large one where you put coats and shirts and things. And there might be shelves for mm-hmm. jeans, trousers, socks and pants. Mm-hmm. Interesting, you're using the word pants. When you say pants, this is uh, the yes, American this is American pants, pants. Yes, meaning trousers. Yes, because pa- when you say pants, I'm thinking underpants. Yeah. It's so complicated, yeah. isn't it? But anyway, so you when you say oh, I'm, 
as you do, I suppose, in a couple. I'm putting my, darling, I'm putting my <laughs> pants in the wardrobe. Um, okay, darling. But you end up saying I'm putting my pants in the pantry. Which makes complete sense. Complete and total sense if you think about it. Pants, pantry. I mean, yeah. really, you should be, the pantry mm-hmm. should be where you put pants. No, but it's not, apparently. What, is a, what is a pantry? It's where you put uh, your stocks of food of uh, uh, for the things that, that can sort of survive, have a long shelf life, right? Yeah. yeah it's sort of like, uh, yeah, it's your stock room. Yeah, it's, it's kind a of, tiny little stock room. It's a sort of yeah, little built-in room. It's 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 about it can be about the size of this room, yeah. <laughs> but if you've got a big house, but otherwise it would be about a quarter of the size of this. It's like you've got a door. It's like a built-in cupboard type room with shelves inside it, and then you've got yeah, all your kind of canned foods and bottles of water and things like that. Yeah, the the pantry. Yeah, um, yeah don't put pants in a no. pantry. I wonder what the etym- etymology of pantry is though. If it's not pants, <laughs> so we'll look it we up. could yeah. check. We could check, listeners. That's something for you to do for homework. There, just <laughs> check out the etymology of the word pantry and yeah. see. see I did Latin in high school, so I'm big into etymology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, what about your French then? So, because you live in France now, how long have you actually been back here in France or here uh, in France? So I moved to France uh, to live here for the first time, uh, end of 2009, um, and I've been here. Well, been here ever since with like in the middle three and a half years in China and uh, another six months uh, living in, in, in New York. But but yeah, since 20, 2009. Yeah. Okay. So what about your French then? Since we're talking about your your languages and stuff, mm. and your English and your accent, what about French? So no, uh, my French is pretty good. I mean, all, mm, I went to school in French abroad and the, fr- the France has a friend, the French educational systems has these French schools all over the world uh, that fall, that all follow the same curriculum. So it's quite easy to move from one place to the other and to not, to not be lost or to be able to have some sense of cont- continuity. So, so my whole ed- education was, uh, was, uh, was in French until the end of high school. So no discernible accent in French, fluent uh, ability to work in French, uh, which is what even if even though I, I I work mostly in English currently at France 24 because that's where my strength is uh, uh, you know and that's where there's there's a need for for people like me uh, but in China I always I always did my reports in two languages in French and in English always back to back live or or any any reports that I would send uh, packages so yeah in French no discernible accent but um, Again, like I feel like uh, maybe this is this is me. This is something that I, I think about myself, but it isn't necessarily true. But I feel like I uh, I'm more comfortable in English in a way mm-hmm. it, because I, I work every day in English. My wife is Australian. We, our language together is is English. I have a daughter who's two and a half years old, but she and to her I speak French, but. I mean, those aren't, <laughs> those aren't, you know, like very tough conversations to have either. So, mm-hmm. um, so sometimes when I find myself having conversations, long conversations in French, I, I feel like I'm just a little bit look of sort of searching for words more, you know? Okay. It's interesting. So at home with your parents growing up, you spoke French. Yeah. And then in, in the international school situation, you were speaking French too. Yeah. Uh, although, you know, maybe it was, French in class, but outside, you know, and with with friends and everything, we'd switch. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'd switch a lot, um, and with my siblings. Uh, weirdly enough, still to still right now, when my as siblings, when we speak together, we speak in English, mm. and when it's the whole family uh, as a whole, with my parents included, then we'll switch to French or we'll do a w- weird mix of two. Maybe maybe as siblings, we thought this it was like the cool thing to speak English amongst the, ourselves and then we the grown-ups would show up and say like, I guess we'll switch to French you know but they speak English too so I don't know like okay very interesting but when you speak to French people you, you mentioned the fact that your English if, it maybe feels like your first language I guess yeah, but you're bilingual um, but English is probably your first language is that right well <laughs> That's the one I struggle with because I was listening to your conversation with the Barbara Serra, the Italian journalist, yeah. and yeah. Uh, she brought up the con- the concept of the dominant language, yeah. uh, which I think is probably more useful to me because I don't remember learning English, but clearly, French is my native tongue. Yeah, yeah, because because that was what was spoken at home, mm-hmm. even if I was in the UK. Do you remember learning French though? No, and I don't remember learning English either. But I feel like. That's got to that's got to count for something that my parents spoke to me in French exclusively. Because her definition of 
being a native speaker was if you can never remember having to learn that yeah. language. So it sounds like you're a native speaker in both French and English by that definition, mm. which means yeah. You... And is that is that the common definition of of native speaker? It's like, or is that her it's, definition? It's, it's, I think that's her definition. I think. There's... I think it's a pretty good one. Uh, would you say that I'm native? You sound like a native to me, mm. even despite the pantry and tiny toes and all that stuff. Yeah, but the thing is, even when you're <laughs> making a mistake like that, it's like a completely accurate mistake. You know what I mean? Mm. You're not making errors that would be maybe influenced by French. You right. Know, you're, not, right. you're not sort of getting... If anything, I tend to make, because I've been using English so much, I tend to make uh, a lot, do a lot of ang more, ang more anglicisms in French than gallicisms in English. Interesting. Yeah. So if we use Barbara's definition of a, of a native speaker uh, as someone who could never remember actually having learned that language, just speaking it from, you know, early childhood, um, and then, you know, there are different definitions of it, but let's just go with that. Um, then you, you may be a native speaker of both. But then she also, as you said, talked about being having a dominant language and um, and then, a I guess, a subdominant language or something. Um <laughs> Do you do you feel like that? Do you feel English is a dominant uh, language? I think I think, but I think yeah, I think that right now English is dominant, but only by a bit. But it's a uh, it can change. Mm -hmm. And if tomorrow I suddenly decided to work for the French Channel at France Twenty Four or for another French network, or you know suddenly had to you know work in French more than in English, that might change uh, because because of habit and and you know ac basically exercising these linguistic muscles. Mm. Oh, it's lucky. You're lucky, aren't you, to have the two? Yeah, I'd say so. I think I think it helps. I think also, yeah, I think learning, have, knowing several languages is uh, it's probably good for the brain to be able to have sets of twos for everything and to be able to to switch tracks. You know, I think yeah. it's probably healthy. I don't I th know. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Um, you know, we'd have to look at science to see. You know, <clears> what, <throat> what what happens to people's brains who are bilingual and whether things like Alzheimer's mm. don't happen. That'd be an interesting uh, guest for this podcast if you found uh, a researcher on, on that topic. I'm very, sure it's around. It's a great idea. I should do that. Yeah. I should I should be more like a, a, a professional journalist. <laughs> so, in the I've way taken over as producer of a Luke's, Luke's English That's language right. <laughs> podcast. I, I welcome these collaborations. <laughs> um, that would be a good idea, yeah, to try and find a sort of a, a neuro-linguist -ling or yeah. something like that. Yeah, that, was, that would be a good idea. Um, Okay, so right, all of this international experience and upbringing, and then um, you studied in the U.S. in Canada, in Canada, Canada, yeah. right? And so, what did you study? I studied. Uh, I was in the sort of faculty of arts, so gen generally like arts and humanities, but um, history and political science, and mostly history. History and political science, mm -hmm. uh, mostly history. What did you did you specialize in something in particular? No, I specialized in procrastination and eating pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Wow. Um, no, I, I I did all kinds. I mean, I think maybe that's why I became a journalist. Is like I I have trouble specializing. I I think there are too many interesting things in the world to specialize in any one particular thing. Mm -hmm. And history is great for that because, you know, it's like history is a very strange, it's like, like an account of everything that ever happened on planet earth. You know, it's, it's, uh, yeah. it's quite wide and you can pick and choose. And so like, that was a great part about, um, studying history in college is like one day I was doing, uh, one semester doing class on 20th century Britain and like doing a deep dive on, on like post-war Britain and the, you know, the rise of, of, of the, the, the welfare state, the welfare state and all that. Very interesting. And, uh, and then the next, uh, semester maybe I was doing, a. I don't know, uh, a history of, uh, of science and medicine and, and, and a history of psychiatry in Africa or whatever. And it, it's, it's all this stuff is, it was wasted on me, on, on, on me being so young. I'd love to do it all again now with more as a fully fledged adult who knows how to handle, you know, uh, a schedule and deadlines. You know? Me too. I, I, <laughs> I often feel like that. I often look back at my days at university and think, wow, I just wasted so many opportunities. Play I got I got very good at Tekken 3 <laughs> and GoldenEye on the Nintendo yeah, 64. Oh man, yeah. I, I scraped my degree. I got I got through it, but you know, I could have taken so many more opportunities. Uh, there was like a student union radio station and stuff. And I just thought, why wasn't I part of I, that? I, I, exactly the same. I, I I remember having like 16 overdue papers before I graduated and just spending a month of 
trying to finish everything because I hadn't done anything before and I did it and I scraped through but like yeah there was there was a there's a school paper there's all kinds of great the, what is it where they say youth is wasted on the young you know yeah it's true but I think maybe at the time if I look back to it you know like that student union radio station actually I remember the people who were really involved in it because there was like a gang of people who were like we're gonna do the radio thing and it was a little kind of a clique mm, you know, yeah of clubs a little Ugh. club of students who were like and and i just felt like i don't want to spend time with these people i don't like them they're mm. just really annoying and you know they're, they're obviously really sort of a bit self-important they're like no we're going to push ourselves to the front and be the ones who do the radio show mm. and other people aren't allowed in mm. and then i was like oh screw you guys then i'm just going to go home and play golden eye yeah. is it you possible know? that you are also you projected onto them things that you know <laughs> weren't true just because you felt uncomfortable about starting yeah. something new yes yeah, sure i basically felt very threatened by it. i wasn't very confident because they they knew what they wanted to do it seems yeah and i i certainly didn't so when you're 18, 19, 20, you're not always that you're not always confident enough to take opportunities, you know, and I yeah, I just didn't have the confidence. I did sort of like write a couple of uh reviews for the magazine and stuff and that was quite good fun. But yeah, I felt like very unsure of myself, which is probably you know, it's probably why I didn't take those opportunities. I needed to spend a lot of time doing stupid things mm -hmm. and then regretting it later you know in order to like you know build up the sort of um thick skin to be actually actually to be able to do things later yeah well yeah. that was just the journey you were on i guess you know yeah, like you can't force things i think i was the same i was the same if, you, if you're not sure of yourself you need to take time to figure out what to be sure of yeah I guess. yeah it's true yeah and that, that does sort of feed into the idea of regrets you know it's, very, it's easy to look back at something like a, a period where you had all these opportunities and you didn't take them and it can make you feel bad, which kind of forms a sort of a loop of like kind of feeling bad about yourself, which then actually um, is counterproductive for the mm. future. So you have to, I guess you have to say to yourself, well, you know, uh, at the time I just wasn't in that, in the right place sort of in myself to, to take those opportunities and this, give yourself a break. Yeah. You know? Give yourself a break too, because I don't know, maybe for you, maybe at least for me, it was, it was, this was also the first time in, uh, you know, my life or your life that you lived on your own and that you left the family home. And that's a lot to adjust to, mm -hmm. to suddenly not have that structure, yeah. not have parents behind, you know, that are telling you what to do or to giving you a sense of, of direction. Everything suddenly is all about you. You're supposed to be an adult from one day to the next. And that can be tough. And, and that's why, you know, there's that temptation to just stay at home and play Tekken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. And oh dear, this this the student house I lived in at university was was uh, just a nightmare. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it was great. It was great. I had a really good time. Yeah. But at the same time, it was also appalling. I can't believe the way we used to live. <laughs> you know, like no one ever did the washing up. I know. Um, the living room was always a total mess. Um, and I mean, that's another story for another time, maybe. Mm. But uh, <laughs> yeah, dear, oh dear. Yes. I think we had very similar experiences. Yes, it sounds like it. I so mean, I had a grizzly yeah. bear as a roommate. So you had a grizzly yeah, bear yeah, as a yeah, roommate, yeah, yeah. yeah, which must have been very interesting. Yeah. Um, all right. So then journalism. So now you are a journalist. And uh, how long have you been doing that then? Um, I started working as a journalist in early 2013, I'd say. But I was in journalism school. Uh, started, uh, started in 2010. I went into journalism school here in Paris at a French uh, journalism school called the uh, uh, CELSA, which is part, of, technically part of the Sorbonne, even if it's a, like a different institution. Okay, okay. And so f and then you came out of that, and you did you instantly get a job at France 24? Uh, not instantly. Um, I did it as part of my master's degree, I had the opportunity to do an extra year and go on exchange in New York and do a semester at a um, journalism school there called the, uh, the City University of New York School of Journalism, uh, CUNY. And um, I, did, I went there, I did that, I managed to get into that program. And while I was there, I met uh, a teacher who put me in touch with the correspondent for CNN in Paris. And basically, I started when that was my first job was being an intern uh, as a producer, 
assistant producer, whatever person to just the person that helps. Yeah, <laughs> and so the lowest rung of the ladder, helping the CNN uh, correspondent with uh, with his reports in Paris, and and that was my first uh, my first job. Um, and then I, after the internship was done, I continued working for them as a freelancer, and then quite quickly I started working as a freelancer at France 24 as well. Yeah, and then at, uh, and then at some point they said, hey, do you want to actually present? Was that it? What was your yeah. first actual experience of using your voice and, mm. and presenting and being on camera or, or right. something like that? I think, uh, so for a while I was an assistant producer, so I was just helping helping the put together the program. Uh, so like finding footage, uh, you know, organizing everything, organi what we call a rundown in, in journalism is sort of the order of all the stories that you're gonna, mm -hmm. uh, you're gonna go through in, in, in a bulletin. So I was, I was working sort of behind the scenes for a while. And then the first step was writing, becoming a desk producer. So, uh, so that's basically where you write scripts and you edit video, often based on agency footage. So news agencies sorry, this mm. are like uh, companies like uh, Associated Press, Reuters, or Agence France Presse uh, that are there, that, that um, their job is basically to do the news gathering and then to send sort of the raw information, raw footage to other news organizations, which will who will repackage it and uh, put it to air for the consumers to uh, to enjoy or to to take in. And uh, as a desk producer, you sort of take these the the this sort of this this information sent by the news agencies and this footage. You edit it together. You write a script and you uh, voice that script uh, on generally for a minute 30 two minutes um and so you you never appear your face doesn't appear on on air but you will your voice does appear so i've worked i worked on my voice before i i worked on appearing on on air as a presenter so you were the guy going you know uh conducting a meeting in a forest is <laughs> yeah. a rare you know, know rare event in politics <laughs> especially you know. right uh, <laughs> and, yeah. and what, what was so there you were putting it all together and then voicing it as you say which mm. is where you sit in front of a microphone yeah. and record the voiceover yeah what was what was that like um that's a really interesting uh, 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 sort of exercise as a journalist, especially because uh, France 24 is a 24-hour news channel. So you're you're on pretty tight deadlines. And generally, the expectation is between the time the editor comes to see, comes to you and says, I'd like you to do a story about, I don't know, uh, this, uh, this uh, terrorist attack in Somalia. We've got some footages, we've got we have some footage, we've got some, uh, some sound bites of um, eyewitnesses, we've got a sound bite of the uh, police chief explaining the situation, uh, a minute 30 go, and you're supposed to sort of do that within two hours, between the moment of being told to do it and the moment, uh, and the moment to air is two hours, and so it's a very quick of of like having a look at. We have this is a very technical. There's a lot of lingo. Mm -hmm. uh, anytime these news agencies send this footage of let's say a terrorist attack in Somalia, there will be an associated what we call a dope sheet, and the dope sheet is a, a piece of paper or a document that has a list of all the shots that are in the footage and describing what's in the shots and who's in the shot and who's speaking and a transcript of the sound bites. And what we call sound bites is when people say something to camera. Um, and so you kind of go through these dope sheets, you organize your thoughts, you write a script, generally all within an hour, you get the script uh, sort of what we in France at France 24, the parlance is to say validated by the editor in chief, and then you get to editing, and then they, the the editor checks your video edit, sees everything's okay, both from a technical standpoint and you know editorial questions. Sometimes sometimes it might be it's like okay, this this shot is a bit too graphic, or you need to blur this or that, and then it goes to air, and that's a, and that's a, you have to do this several times a day uh, as part of a shift. You you might do two or three a day. Uh, or often sometimes more uh, and it's uh, it's a pretty high intensity job so at the beginning were you able to do that uh, to a deadline mm, sometimes you miss a deadline and, and what you learn is that you have to communicate effectively about missing the deadline you'll have to go and see your editor i'm sorry this is 
a more complicated story than I initially thought, or I'm not getting the footage that we need, so can you give me more time? And you actually find out quite quickly that it's better to communicate and ask for an extension than to not say anything and just ha see that the team on air is counting on your package when, uh, in a two minutes from air and when it's not going to be ready. Yeah. So that's also a big part of the, the challenge of working in a 24-hour news channel is you can't do anything if you don't communicate effectively between all the people on the team. Yeah, so don't just sort of sit on your own kind of panicking yeah, on, uh, no. silently. No, there's no point. Uh, no, no, this is not school. You're not going to get like docked marks for being late. Uh, the, the point is to is to is for is for everything to run to run smoothly. So if you take an extra hour, you take an extra hour. That's too bad. You'll get better as you do it, and you get you'll get faster. Yeah, teamwork. You have to tell everyone, and then they'll they'll be able to like. Uh, change things to to allow for the fact that your report won't be ready or something like mm -hmm, that and exactly gradually every day you get better and better at yeah. it and what you learn too is that everyone knows how to everyone was working in this very high stress uh fast-paced environment and everyone knows how to adapt to unforeseen sort of circumstances and changes that, mm. that's not what we deal with it's breaking news this happens every day almost so so people are very good at adapting and and being flexible mm -hmm. generally mm. If they're not, that can happen too, and it's unpleasant. <laughs> yeah, because then you're working with a, a difficult person. Yeah, or yeah. yeah, but also like it's a it's a it's a balance. You need to strike a balance between because sometimes if someone's difficult, it's because they have high standards, and you don't want to give up on the standards either. So like, it's it's complicated. Yeah, yeah, interesting. But yeah, teamwork. Yes, absolutely. Um, so what about then the first time you were on camera? Oh boy. I think my first time on camera was uh, presenting a sports bulletin. Uh, so, uh, so that's, you know, uh, you'll have the main anchor who's, uh, who's presenting the main news and who's, who, uh, start, the show starts with him saying the headlines. And then generally you'll have other segments within the bulletin. Maybe you'll have uh, the sports guy. Maybe you have the business guy. I'm the business guy. And my first time on air was as a replacement sports presenter. And I have never watched it back uh, because no matter i think barbara sarah mentioned it like the f anytime someone's on tv for the first time they all have that same deer in the headlights look and suddenly it's like because also suddenly you're you have to wear a suit you have to wear a tie <laughs> you've you know you're all made up and you got like hair gel and like all that stuff and you're in this very strange environment because you're in a studio with these hot lights and these yeah. massive cameras yeah. some of the cameras are moving the big thing that always surprises people is the prompter. Because um, so at France 24, presenters write their own scripts, which is you know uh, not necessarily always the, ca the case. Sometimes presenters reword scripts written by producers so that they can focus more on interview prep, other things. As, and it's not to say that they're not writers; is that they basically there's a different allocation of resources. France mm -hmm. 24 is a bit of a smaller budget operation, so you write your own scripts and you have a prompter, so you can read the script you wrote for yourself. That's where it's like a screen which projects the script. Exactly. Uh, so that you, you, it's kind of like projected onto glass, yeah. and the camera is behind the glass, so you can look at the camera but read your script at the same time. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, and at France, in other organizations, someone uh, sort of moves that prompter for you. Mm -hmm. At France 24, you have a pedal that you press on oh really to make that sort of prompter roll, roll down so that you can keep reading basically the text rolls down yeah. uh, depending on how you push the exactly pedal. and so if you push too hard it goes too fast and if you don't push hard enough it doesn't move <sighs> and so you got to handle all of that as mm -hmm. and in addition to being on tv for the first time yeah there's all this technical stuff side also obviously you do a couple of you know uh sort of rehearsals or, or dry runs, but in nothing, there's nothing like the real thing. So then you just start doing it and you get better and you start slowly being more comfortable, losing that deer in the headlights look and... Deer in the headlights. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just an expression, listeners. I don't know if everyone's familiar with it, but a deer in the headlights, also a rabbit in the headlights. Mm. It's just like, yeah, if a car is driving along the road and an animal is in the road at night and the animal just yeah. kind of has that look on its face... Uh, where it's just frozen uh, uh, like that so yeah uh, it's uh, the deer in the headlights yeah. it could be very awkward for people watching actually I, my my wife was looking at me that night she she just uh she, i mean she was very happy for me to get this opportunity and everything but i think at one point again with the prompter the pedal wasn't working or something i lost the prompter and then i had to, so that's why you also print out 
papers with your notes mm. but like then trend that transition from prompter not working down to the notes and then you're maybe you're not at the right spot in your notes and then you know there's panic setting in and i think she, she i remember her telling me that she she just uh she just took the remote and shut it and then threw the remote in the air it's like i don't want to watch this it's too awkward <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh yeah you see that on the news sometimes the the news be- reader will be just reading you know casually looking at the camera and then sometimes suddenly they start looking down at their mm. papers and start shuffling through their papers and you think uh-oh there's a problem with the prompter Mm. yeah yeah okay not to say that you know like some and some presenters are very good at switching from notes to prompter to improvisation Mm -hmm. and over time you 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 get better at at just be at basically trusting yourself to be able to continue without your notes basically which are, can, can be a bit of a crutch it's a it's very impressive it's a very impressive sort of set of skills a very particular set of skills <laughs> um, it is very impressive being able to do that and especially those moments where uh, presenters have to uh, speak uh, spontaneously for example, comment, comment, mm. commentating on something that's happening, like for example, the royal wedding, or <laughs> or you know the, the yeah. coronation of, of King Charles or something, and you've got like the best presenters who are basically talking almost nonstop for five hours while looking at mm-hmm. quite often quite boring, uneventful footage of cars driving along roads, yeah. and the the commentators have to just keep going and keep mm. talking. Um, it's very impressive that the way they are able to do it and keep it coherent and uh, logical and clear and stuff uh sometimes it doesn't work and uh <laughs> presenters end up rambling and it goes into like un- unintentional comedy um, yeah yeah do you know do you know alan partridge the character um yeah i know i know i think he's the perhaps maybe the most famous fictional englishman in the world i you like think? every english person or british person i know Brings up Partridge, Part, Partridge at one point in in the conversation. He's just this incredibly sort of dominating presence in in, the, in English culture. I yeah, find. definitely. Yeah, in the UK, not so much in the states or internationally, but in the UK, uh, Alan Partridge is just like absolutely a household name. Everyone knows who he is, and he yeah, he just like occupies this very interesting position in our culture where not he started out as a parody of of newsreaders, in fact, sports reporters mm. at the beginning. And then news readers, and then TV presenters. He was like, he presented a sort of a, a parody chat show, and then then we got a kind of a a sort of documentary kind of thing following him in his life, and so we got to get an image, we got an insight into his daily life and stuff. And he didn't just become a parody of news readers, but a parody of just of of a person, a certain type of English man, mm. you know, of a certain age. And it's just an incredibly uh, compelling. Um, and funny character um, and yeah so uh, we, everyone can kind of relate to it in yeah. England which is weird because so, so, it's a mix of he's quite pretentious and he has a, he's, yeah. he is a very he's a very he's got he's self-important absolutely with no but there's nothing backing it up right yeah he has no qualities no particular set of skills about anything he's not particularly smart but he has this sort of undying belief in himself Yes, it's a kind of like a sense of um, um, l- that he should be on primetime uh, television. That he has this, uh, yeah, this, this, yeah, this, um, yeah, this. What's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. I can't think of it. But he 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 has this sense that he absolutely should be primetime television, and it's. As a, as a media figure, I mean, that makes fun of the media because, you know, there is a certain amount of self-importance and arrogance and, and ambition, mm. uh, self-serving ambition that you get from people in the media who just basically, their pri- priority is to just be in the spotlight. Mm. Uh, but also, there's a deeper sort of psychological aspect to it as well, which is kind of like he's a... He's a sort of uh, a toxic male in a way that he, you know, just wants everything. He he just wants everything to be about him, mm. and so it's a the the guy who plays him, Steve Coogan, the actor, and the guys who write for him. Steve Coogan writes and and acts as as Partridge, but he's got a couple of other people writing for him. They use him as a vehicle to kind of make fun of. Um, so, uh, certain kinds of like right wing. Mm. Um, uh, uh, bigoted uh, males that voted for Brexit or something mm-hmm. like that, but it's even even 
it's even broader than that somehow because Partridge occupies this interesting space where he is political, but he's sort of not political as well because his politics is often defined by his attempt to stay relevant in the public eye. Like he's he's essentially a small-minded Daily Mail reading uh, right. conservative, but he knows that in order to be acceptable in the media, he has to have a certain sense right. of sort of wokeness about him. He's basically Piers Morgan. Yeah. He is absolutely like Piers Morgan. So Piers Morgan is definitely a target for Coogan and he's definitely making fun of Piers Morgan and a few other people like Richard Maidley is a is a TV presenter that you might not know outside the UK. He's probably not famous, but Richard Maidley is it's unbelievable how similar to Partridge he mm. is. But other people too, like Jeremy Clarkson from Top Gear and all the other Top Gear guys. And anyway, I just mentioned Alan Partridge because, you know, um, Partridge is an example of a sort of very mediocre uh, broadcaster who thinks he's he, sh he deserves to be the best. He's like a, a D-grade broadcaster stuck inside the body of an A-grade broadcaster, <laughs> right? So he's sort of like, or, or something like that, yeah. right? He's got the belief, the, the belief that he believes he's an A-class a, a broadcaster, but he's a D-class yeah, broadcaster. His, his, Natural Home is a, a sort of cable TV news channel uh, or a local radio station or something like that. That's his natural habitat. But that's the thing. There are some fantastic local radio yeah. station anchors who know what they're doing because that's, you know, I'd say local like local radio is the best. Like, I mean, that's, uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't mean to, hmm. to uh, criticize local radio or something, but... Uh, Anyway, anyway yeah. so I just said that because <laughs> because uh, Partridge is an example of what happens when a a, a a broadcaster isn't doesn't have those amazing skills and ends up kind of rambling into mm -hmm. sort of nonsensical madness, yeah. you know. And it's often very very funny. I think that's kind of what part how Partridge started, which was like you would be it was a, it was a parody of a certain type of thing that we'd all seen on TV, which is a reporter talking and you realize they've got three minutes the producer is telling them you've got three more minutes you've got to keep talking and they end up talking about something they reveal something about them, <laughs> their personal life and it just gives you a little glimpse into yeah, like yeah. a ridiculous life that this person has those those moments are so tricky uh the the little bits of sort of time allotted for you know banter or chit chat at the end of uh, a news hour or something like that like i and those can be really tricky because you, you don't know what might come out and sometimes you're too comfortable and like I, I, I present the business news every day and I uh, I can't remember what happened but like I, I mentioned some particular stock and how it was not doing very well just because the company itself was going through these challenges and the presenter just well you know I hope you're in blah 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 stock uh, you, know, you don't have too much blah 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 stock and I just sort of blurted out like I don't have any stock I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, uh, which is sort of a weird thing you want to hear from uh, from someone who's supposed to cover the business news every day Suddenly, but like <laughs> the, the curtain was pulled back, yeah. and like uh, a more informal, realistic version of you popped out, and it was very incongruous. Again, it wasn't um, conventional. Yeah. And suddenly, the conventions of that news broadcast were broken, and it was mm -hmm. an interesting. Moment. In, in a way, though, that's a probably it's probably a very good thing. It means I have no conflict of interest. I mean, it means that I can report, uh, you know, objectively about most companies in the world because I don't have a stake in uh, in their in their in, in their financial health or yeah, not. So, yeah. actually, you know, that was a great thing that I said. Yeah. Yeah. Good. And yeah, also because uh, it's true <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely um all right so these days you are presenting on on france 24 regularly and and um presenting at the moment this program called people and profits but mm -hmm. also you you do other things as well yeah um, so uh mm -hmm. basically uh, every day as well uh, on the on the morning edition of france 24 i present the business uh, the business segment so where i'll i'll sort of go through uh, some of the big uh, business stories of the day, or business or economics. I think sometimes I, uh, business makes it sound like it's just all you know corporate news, or you know um, Apple's doing this, or Nvidia's doing that, or uh, Total Energy, and you know that can be the case. But sometimes it's also just uh, um, it can be more economic sort of uh, news stories about inflation or about how to you know. Um, uh, 
uh, I don't know, you know, or 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 social stories, you know, like um, the, the the textile industry in, in Bangladesh and and the, the the situation for workers there and how much they're getting paid, how you know, uh, how, how the companies that are paying them, all that all that stuff. So it's a very sort of wide range of stories. What's a what's a story that you've covered recently? Uh, you, have you covered the Olympics in in Paris? We did an episode of People and Profit on the uh, uh, potential sort of like uh, economic. Uh, Benefits. Benefits of, of hosting the Olympics. Um, uh, we had uh, a researcher who studied this uh, on as well. And we also had our one of our reporters went to um, a factory in Brittany in Western France that uh, is making plush toys uh, based on the Olympic mascot with the official Olympic branding. And what was interesting about that a particular uh, factory is that um, basically they're using the Olympics as a way to try and and and, and boost the idea of, of made in France uh, manufacturing, which uh, we've lost uh, over time to p places where labor is cheaper. Mm -hmm. And so now p the question is, uh, can can the Olympics help b sort of boost uh, manufacturing in France. Uh, yeah. And there's a lot of problems with that because, you know, labor is still more expensive. And also over time, we've lost uh, know-how, expertise to uh, places like China, where they, they just are so good at doing that kind of stuff now that it's hard to compete. So there's some really interesting um, stories, economics or, or business stories associated with the Olympic Games. Yeah, I did an episode recently called Is uh, Paris Ready for the Olympics? I basically just read a, an article about it and <laughs> talking about how, uh, you know, the, the, the it, it's quite a challenge to get it set up and there are potential problems and, and so on. Um, and, you know, just sort of talked a bit about the subjects of how people feel about the Olympics and whether it's actually beneficial, you know, whether it really does um, bring economic benefits, whether it helps people living in the city or not. In Paris, people don't really feel very good about the Olympics yeah. at this moment. And we're recording this, by the way, in May, so it's it's still a few weeks away. Like the Olympics is about eight weeks away it's from us. It's in July, twenty seventh of July. Twenty seventh of July. Yeah, so I a think couple, that's the opening ceremony. Yeah, a couple of months away from us now. This might be published a little bit closer to the actual Olympics themselves, and things might might have changed a bit. But what do you think? What how? how um, I feel yeah. like uh, those who benefit the most from the economic aspect of the Olympics are the large corporations that <laughs> that sponsor the Olympics and that you know get the the rights to sell drinks and beverages at uh, designated Olympic sites and you know maybe perhaps it's a good thing like the interesting thing about the Paris Olympics is they made their whole pitch is like we've seen the Olympics in Rio we've seen the Olympics in Sochi and we've seen how much money is spent on what they call white elephant projects so um, large you know, infrastructure projects, stadiums, things like that, that don't actually have, don't make sense from a, an economic point of view, where they'll be great for the two months of the of the, the competition, but then they won't have any use and they'll, 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 they'll be a, a money pit, basically. And many of the Olympics in the past have been like that. Uh, Athens, uh, the, the Athens Olympics in 2004... I think mm. so, yeah, 2004, uh, which was a centenary uh, Olympics. They built a whole stadium, and, and like they're still, uh, they're still paying that back. I think the Montreal Olympics in 1976, the Olympic Stadium, which they built there, covered stadium, state-of-the-art back then. Like That's still something that they haven't fully paid back, or I mean, I need to, I need to check in, but like it's, been, it's been a real uh, yeah, yeah, a money pit, basically, or a place where you lose money. Um, so... Uh, Paris, as opposed to that, they are only, for the large majority, only using existing infrastructure. The only new thing they built is a pool in Saint-Denis or Aubervilliers, the Olympic pool. Uh, that's the only new piece of infrastructure they're building for the Games. Uh, and they'll say they're saying that they're going to reuse this uh, basically as a community pool where you know schools in the area can go and everything and it'll, it'll have value. That's what they're saying. Um, and the other thing is like the Olympic Village that they're building, like those where the athletes are going to stay and all that, all that will be repurposed as uh, housing afterwards, which is important in Paris. There's a there's a there's a bit of a housing shortage, especially affordable housing. So shortage. the reason that one of the reasons the city would want the Olympics, despite the way that they they must know that a lot of Parisians are not very happy about the idea of all the disruptions and stuff. But one of the reasons that Paris would go for it is because it gives them a way to invest in the city, 
in various ways. Yeah, and it's a it's a good impetus to you know to build new metro lines to beef up the you know and like that's the whole challenge right now. We're seeing a lot of construction around Paris because they're trying to get everything ready for the Olympics, um, and hopefully they will. Uh, but that can be a good thing, you know. That can be a good thing. Like there's a, there is a, there are real problems in Paris in terms of having access to the city to the city center from the suburbs that you know basically people rely on these four or five suburban train lines that are often overpacked that are often falling yeah. uh you know that does often have technical problems so um so you know they're, they're they're extending some metro lines they're they're building new uh new metro lines it's all part of this this is a plan that existed beforehand but i think the olympics helped sort of like re put, put new momentum in all this you kind know? of drives the changes mm -hmm. and put gives a specific deadline yeah. which allows everyone to say right we've got to get this done before this right. certain date and for example i think the city has said there can be no scaffolding in the city uh, during the Olympics. So all the big building work and cleaning works that are being done on major buildings all have to be done by this certain date. And the Olympics can be used as a, yeah, as a sort of a, a way to really focus people and make people get things done on time because things drag on, don't they, you know, often. But yeah, at the same time, the Olympics is controversial because of course there's a lot of investment that goes essentially into the into the uh, hands of those large corporations it doesn't always trickle down into you know the local communities in mm -hmm. every yeah. time yeah yeah um all right so m m this might be the last thing we talk about because we could go on and on and on for ages but uh, you lived you mentioned that you lived in china for for three years yeah just over three years yeah. just over three years mm. can you tell us a little bit about what that was like where where did you live i lived in beijing Okay. Um, yeah, moved there in 2018. Um, I moved there to be basically to work as a journalist. Uh, and uh, I was the correspondent for France 24 there in, in French and in English. Uh, but I also worked for other outlets on different projects. Um, so I was, I, was, um, I was my own boss. I was independent there. Um, so I moved there in 2018 and I came back in, at the end of 2021. Um, after COVID, so yeah, I was or there. During I was there during COVID, yeah. and uh, and yeah, once COVID happened, I, I basically couldn't leave. Uh, it's not that I couldn't leave; it's just that I couldn't go back in. Yeah, uh, they, if you'd left China, you yeah, wouldn't have been able to come back. Foreigners in. would not for a really long time. Foreigners, unless with very specific sort of derogations or. Uh, sort of, uh, yeah, a, a very like a high level authorization. You you couldn't to go back in basically, okay. um, <laughs> and so yeah, I was uh, I well, the question was uh, how was it or yeah, just <laughs> what, what was it like? No. What was it like living uh, in China? Uh, big, lots of people. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's uh, it's really hard to answer that question because it's such a massive place uh, with uh, with so much history with so many different parts, so many different people. Um, and I loved my experience there. That doesn't mean it was always a good experience or, or an easy experience, but I really feel like I have a better understanding of the world um, because China has such a huge place in that world as this world's second biggest economy and as a sort of a country that's offering or presenting a different, a different model than the one that we're we've been accustomed to growing up in Western developed countries, the the American model. And now, um, you go there, and it's uh, it's quite confronting if you if you've been uh, brought up uh, with a certain set of values to see uh, to see a country like China. Um, that's developed and in a way, you know, that it's everything, like there's nuance to everything and it's quite complicated, but in a way is a success story. Mm -hmm. um, and still basically being an authoritarian regime, a dict you know, a dictatorship's not, pro I, it's really like, this is where we get into do you complicated. Do you, have, do you have to watch your words? Cause you, cause you work for France 24. I mean, um, or, no, or, I think, I think I've, I've been, these are things that I've, I've shared and like, um, I, I'm no longer the Beijing correspondent, and um, I guess I'm, I don't know. I, I, I think it's I think it's all right. <laughs> yeah, really? okay. I think it's all right. all right. No, I think I'm watching my words because I want to be truthful and I want to be fair. Yeah. Um, and I think it's fair to say that it's an authoritarian regime uh, that's that controls China. That there's no individual rights aren't 
don't exist to the extent that it, they exist uh, here in Europe or in the United States or in the UK. Um, and that doesn't mean that um, people aren't satisfied. Uh, you meet a lot of people who've, you know, you know, uh, really benefited from what uh, from from the decisions that have been taken there. So that's really confronting for someone like me who's grown up with that belief uh, in individual rights and. Um, it's also confronted that <laughs> that belief now. Uh, it's, it's also sort of could reinforce that belief now after the fact. Um, yeah, I see. It's reinforced the belief in individual rights yeah. after the, after the fact, even though you you, you have a nuanced view of it, yeah. it which it, um, acknowledges that some people are perfectly happy with it, mm -hmm. but obviously some people. Are certainly aren't you know it yeah. depends who you are and, and what the same you do way, like, like a lot of people are unhappy and dissatisfied with uh, with uh, with with where democracy has gone today yeah. like there's a lot of a lot of issues there yeah i think it's important to acknowledge the nuance in any of these situations and to avoid these sort of broad strokes or large uh, sweeping statements about this kind of thing and it's also important to be able to have a conversation mm -hmm. in which you acknowledge the nuances and stuff um that we're getting sort of political now yeah. which is which is obviously going to happen because you know we're talking about uh it's uh, hard to talk about china without being political yeah but i also am curious about um uh just generally the experience so there's mm -hmm. lots of different things so you, you mentioned it was confronting uh, meaning it was a sort of a shock, a sort of culture shock, I suppose. Yeah. And you talked about the, the sort of political culture mm. and the way that the country is run, which is obviously a massive thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but what about other cultural aspects? Uh, I mean, things like, you know, what was it like just like walking down the street, getting, <laughs> getting going to work or mm. just getting lunch or something like that, you know? Yeah, well... Um, uh the, the the layout of the city of Beijing is so different. Like uh, Paris is a dense, compact city where it's very it's eminently walkable, you know. And, yeah. and then public transport is, is really is really good that way. Beijing is is a, is like a modern city that's been sort of built to, to sort of spread out a lot more. And there's like public transport, a lot a lot of that as well. But the, it's these massive boulevards, very sort of, I guess, communist, if you think about yeah. it. And these massive boulevards, these like huge sidewalks, everything's much bigger. So you got, you got the sense that this thing that looks so, like it's just around the corner is actually like a 20 minute walk. Cause that's because that's just the, the next intersection. But yeah. just say the scale is so much bigger. So, mm. so you realize quite quickly, walking is not the best way around. You'll lose a lot of time so quite quickly I, I i i got myself a bike and and then suddenly everything felt like it was uh, like it was more accessible and all that and so and then suddenly and you have huge bike lanes and you get to take on the city and suddenly that the city opens up at, when you're on a bike or a, or a scooter and it's really lovely you get all you know in, in spring you've got a lot of uh, these ginkgo trees that that are just lovely and uh, a lot of uh, the beijing is a bit there's a there's a bit of uh, there's a bit of a uh, sort of activity in the street, but it's um, it's it tends to be a little bit hidden. So sometimes sometimes it can lack a bit of character. Um, but because it's the stuff's going on behind gl yeah, the, closed the, doors in a way. There's like uh, unless it depends on the neighborhood. Like uh, in some of the more older neighborhoods uh, that you go in these these the hutongs, the alleyways. Um, it's all this sort of network of smaller little passages and and, and like and, and and pedestrian streets where there's lots of little restaurants and shops and all that and that's that's quite teeming with activity and all that and that's quite nice and there's lots of great food and all that but then other neighborhoods are more modern and then you'll see that you know things are in malls more often or and that's a bit too bad and I think there's a sense that is, there's a sense that uh, um, maybe there the idea of development is malls. Or the idea of a modern city is to have malls, and also, except, <laughs> aside, a collateral benefit to all that is it's much easier to monitor a mall uh, from a from a security standpoint than it is to have uh, street-facing shops everywhere and to have more chaos that way. So that's sort of like uh, 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 one of the downsides of, of of how it's happened. But um, no, I mean it's 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 a fantastic thing. You you really feel like when you go to China for the for first time, you feel like you had a blind spot your whole life. Um, meaning? Meaning that there was there's this whole, there was an elephant in the room and you hadn't seen the elephant and the room is the planet. And the, the elephant in the room, listeners, just in case you weren't <laughs> aware, um, and I wonder if people who are still listening 
uh, I wonder if like, anyone who's still listening doesn't know the phrase the elephant in the room anyway but the elephant in the room is it, 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 you're having a conversation and um, there's a subject that no one is talking about but it's an incredibly obvious subject and a hugely important thing but no one is talking about it like for example if you know a discussion about uh, a discussion about politics in the UK in 2016 and or it's a discussion about politics in the UK at any time now uh, where people are talking about the uh, state of the economy and the elephant in the room is Brexit like hello mm. Brexit's obviously been a really bad idea and it's been bad for the economy but no one brings it up no one mentions it because if you do mention it then you end up getting stuck into a, a sort of divisive de mm. debate and people want to avoid uh, you know evoking the, the you know all the disagreements and the misery of, of, of that mm -hmm. and so people just don't talk about Brexit but it's obviously a huge big thing so it's that that's the elephant in the room yeah, and, and it's you know the the idiom i guess is obvious when you th imagine talking about uh, just having a sitting down having a cup of tea and there's an elephant in the room and it, you know it's gonna it could destroy everything but no one's talking about the fact there's an elephant in the room but not that china is a thing that could oh god <laughs> <coughs> but in the sense that china was the elephant in the room in the sense that it was this big really important really significant and uh, it's, place but you, you'd never really thought about it that well, much well i feel like it's undercovered compared cons compared to its weight in world affairs you know, that even like a lot of what we do here uh, would take on new meaning if we if we had more of a if we had a, if we if we had in our minds uh, more often what's happening in China. So if we think if we compare it to the United States, which is very loud, very yeah. brash, very attention seeking, yeah. the US is like, hey guys, look at me okay. all the time. Like, you know, like yeah, the, the, typically the kind of thing about the US that's so funny is like people can name the you know like the senator from Wisconsin or you know can, can, are able to say that oh you know Sarah Palin was a governor of Alaska or. Or, uh, yeah, Fetterman is uh, the guy from Pennsylvania. Like they all, they know all the intricacies of this a polity of this of this system of governance that's not theirs. You mean like foreigners? Yeah, like foreigners people in France for are example. so in tune with what's happening politically in the United States yeah. and l know little to nothing about what's happening politically yeah. in China, which yeah. is also the you know one's a transparent system, the other's not. Yeah. Uh, or but it's, that's also the case. Like uh, people know about you know, congressional politics in the U.S. and aren't able to, uh, you know, to, 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 to say whether, uh, you know, Germany is a federal state or not, or, or know nothing about German politics, even though technically we're more, we're closer to Germany. Anyway, I'm a bit but, of a tangent. But, but the point is that, that uh, you know, compared to the China, like compared to America, which is very sort of uh, visible and um, present in our lives uh, to a large extent, certainly in this part of the world, uh, China, on the other hand, is hugely significant, hugely influential, and for example, all you need to do is look around and go, oh, are these microphones made in China, the cable made in China, you know, mm -hmm. all this stuff, our phones are all made in China. Made in China is written on almost, you know, on so many things that we have in this room or in any anywhere, you mm -hmm. know, the, it, but it's like a little bit more low key. Mm -hmm. um, some, I, some of the examples here are with regards to the environment, you know, we, we're, we're working really hard here to, to, to reduce our carbon footprint as like, oh, should we take the train or, or a plane? Well, we should, should definitely should take a train. Maybe we'll just won't go to Bali anymore or something like that. Yeah, you know, like, yeah. it was like, but meanwhile, you got over a billion people in China uh, who have a much bigger impact and their network, uh, their electric network is still mostly, is still dependent on coal. And so mm. you got to keep these things in mind. And so now China's doing a lot to try and, and, and curb that, but like, that's something very important to keep in mind. Uh, less political, but you know, when I move, when I travel to China for the first time, so this was before I moved there, you go to Beijing and you realize suddenly that as a, as a Western tourist uh, in a far flung place like China, um, generally you go somewhere like Southeast Asia or I don't know, and you are used to being catered to Meaning? as a tourist being that your needs as a tourist is what people want to meet are, are, are what people are want to meet because uh, you're the source of money and you're the person who will be able to you know uh, uh, give that give people a livelihood by spending money locally so so there's an industry of tourism yeah. like i mean france is a great example yeah. where you can come and there's like actually a whole system a whole structure and mm. a whole um, industry built around helping the tourists come in providing accommodation providing food mm. providing attractions and things to do and it's mm. like it's like kind of like disneyland or something exactly um, and yeah but 
but China's not like that. You, well, if it? you if you go there as a British person or as a French person, you realize quite quickly that most of the tourism industry is geared towards local tourists. So it's Chinese from, people visiting... From other, visiting Beijing, visiting the capital. Right. Uh, and all the tours, all the signage is in Chinese because that's the bigger part of the tourism yeah, market. of course. Yeah. Uh, and so there's not as much of an incentive for people to learn English or for signs to be in English uh, because just because you're not that important yeah. uh, in the grand scheme of things. That's like, a, that was a blind spot. That's a revelation. That's a, you know, that's, a, that's being put down a peg, which is always good. Yeah, you know? yeah. That was a, a good, th you see it as like a, uh, just on an individual personal basis, you're not making some big criticism about China here, just to be clear. <laughs> you're actually just describing the experience of going there and feeling completely out of your depth or feeling mm -hmm. kind of a bit lost like a fish out of water mm -hmm. because you realize that the whole system is it, it, it doesn't really you don't matter you're not that important really yeah. in the scheme of things because, which is always true but in, it, yeah <laughs> it is in fact but i know exactly how you feel because i mean i i lived in japan but japan is obviously completely different to china uh but i got a taste of it because when i was there there wasn't a lot of english in signage you know and uh, you, I would often feel quite lost and out of my depth and sort of feel like, oh my God, I've, and also felt like I stuck out like a sore thumb, mm. meaning I just looked very different to everyone else. Um, what about people? How did people, how did people treat you? Just kind of like people in your everyday life. Did you, did you, did they treat you uh, as a special person, as a foreigner, or were you not? Because like in, yeah. uh, to compare it to Japan, often as a, uh, when you come as an English person, you be you'll be treated really well a lot of the time i mean not always depends but a lot of the time people are very sort of uh, happy to meet you and they're mm. very sort of uh, um, people are very interested mm -hmm. in you and stuff like that i would even sometimes have people stop me in the street and say oh you know where are you from you know and they're like because they'd been to australia mm. for two weeks and you know 10 yeah. years ago so they're like oh i you know and they have to tell you that oh, i went to australia like are you australian no i'm from england oh wow <laughs> you know uh, but is it similar in china yeah, yeah i think uh, i think the especially like it really depends like um, I mean, generally quite nice. Everyone very, um, very friendly to to foreigners interested in in talking to you, finding out more about you. Um, uh, you know, wanting to a lot of people wanting to practice their English, uh, especially in big cities like 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 Be like Beijing. Um, sometimes just curiosity of seeing like sometimes in Beijing, especially as you have many visitors from other parts of China where they might might not see as many visitors. You'll you know you'll see you'll ask people ask for your picture just because yeah, really? you're a white person or yeah. i remember biking in the south in like and i think i was i did a, a biking trip in yunnan in the south in a, a province in the south of china and going through some um you know smaller towns or even villages and like having kids just like point at me and like point at my beard because like beards aren't necessarily the, uh, a lot of men don't necessarily have beards there and like wow this is the this is what i got a special kind of white guy here i like, I got, <laughs> like collecting pikachu card, like like pokemon cards or something i got this one this is a pretty valuable one right there um, so, so in that sense, like really friendly and, uh, and, you know, wanting to make you feel welcome and a lot, an intense pride of where they're from as well, I'd yeah. say. Uh, but then there's the other aspect of it is as, as a journalist, then suddenly if you, it, the, the, it, the whole thing is completely, uh, sort of, uh, what's the, what the, the word I'm looking for? The tables are turned or, or? um, skewed once you say you're a journalist, basically. Um, because then there's fear then there's, oh, this is going to be trouble for me. No matter how political the story is. Well, on, a, on an individual, so what, you're, you're going in to report on some local business and you say, what's it like with the, the how's the weather been affecting yeah. you? So even before that, I, I'll stop you. I'll make the phone call being like, I'd like to come and visit you, you to talk about this thing. Let's let's call it a weather event. Yeah. Right? Let's or just something, wanna, something you know, neutral, like a weather event. Like there's been extreme weather and you mm. know, how's it been affecting you? Yeah. Something like that. Just a neutral thing. Even. So that's that's really tough because um, that because <laughs> quite quickly you'll get to government response and help. And so and so 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 if you you know, like the government will want to the, you know, local authorities will want to control whatever you, you cover about that. I, I'll give you an example uh, about a non-political story where you don't necessarily expect interference. Uh, I did a story about uh, winemakers, uh, female uh, women, women winemakers in this one province in central western China called Ningxia. Um, 
and it was this was a commission from a program at France 24. They wanted to they wanted to, to you know to find out what it was like uh, for women to work in that industry in China. So it's quite a novel story, quite weird. People don't expect wine to be, uh, you know, made in China, and people don't expect, uh, you know, and and there's a, another added angle to this is like, oh, there's there's quite a lot of women in this industry. Um, so I make a phone call because I can't. It's, it's quite far away, so I make a phone call to a couple of wineries and and uh, not wineries, um, vineyards, vineyards, yeah, uh, and. Uh, and they say at first they're like, oh yes, it would be great. You can come when we and when the harvesting season happens, and then quite quickly I'm like, I get another phone call. I was like, oh, but could you make sure you call the provincial prop- propaganda department, so the well, communications or the information department of of that province to get prior approval? And so I said, well, I don't. I'd rather not. I think I'd. I mean, it's just between the two of us. I don't see why why the provincial uh, propaganda department has anything to do with your your private uh, business. And it's like it would be it would be better for everyone if we if we did because they're worried about how it might impact them. So that's exactly right. Because every because the government is so present in everyone's lives that if you're seen to be speaking to a foreign reporter. Um, then your people are going to ask questions, so they just want to be on the safe side with the government to make sure that no red lines are crossed in terms of the. And the issue here is that in that particular region, there is a sizable Muslim minority in Ningxia province. It's not far from Xinjiang, where there's uh, the, the 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 Uyghur population, which has been extensively covered with the sort of re-education campaign taking place there and mm. the UN saying over a, a million people have been going through these re-education camps and with, re-education yeah, camps some people going as far as using the word genocide or cultural genocide uh, to describe what's been happening yeah. to that to that population so so that's sort of the background so foreign journalists going to this other province where there is a Muslim minority uh, even not to do that particular not to work on that particular story suddenly there's like this pressure to be in line with what the government is asking you to do. And so that means when we showed up, we had every interview we did, we had, there was like these three or four random guys that were around just keeping a, keeping a track on things, keeping an eye on things. Uh, that means that we were told to go and stay at one particular hotel, not another uh, hotel, because that's potentially the one where they can keep an eye on you. That also means that the night at the hotel, when we were about to go to bed, we had local police come by, ask us to come down to answer more questions about what our itinerary would be and where we would be and what we would be doing. Uh, a lot of this is just intimidation. A lot of this is just telling you that they're looking, they're watching, and that you better not cross any red lines. And that's what it's like working as an... And it, it can get so much worse as a journalist, as a foreign journalist working in China, in terms of this sort of intimidation and in terms of these atta- uh, uh, sort of uh, attacks on media freedoms, basically. Mm. The reality, though, is you're in a, you're in a country where... Media freedom doesn't exist to, to in the at least not the way that that we see it here. Very interesting. What do you think when people say that essentially it's the same in in like France or America? I say that's bullshit. <laughs> I'm saying like you can say you can really say what you want with. I'm not going to say no consequence, but there's a, there's a framework here for you to say what you want to say and to defend yourself in court. Right. Yeah. That that does not exist in China. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think there's a lot of false equivalencies made about, uh, you know, in this whole conversation over, um, you know, the the excesses of woke culture, all, all that. It's like no, I mean, this is what this is what a free society looks like. It's an it's a society that argues and fights all the time, but that's that's the point. That's how you know you're in a free you have you have free speech is when people vehemently argue at each other uh, about different different stories. Yeah. When everyone appears to be saying the same thing and si- si- singing from the same hymn sheet, that's probably the sign that there is, you know, the problems with free speech. Mm-hmm. Okay. I got, got a serious there. <laughs> we, got serious. The end. <laughs> we got serious there. No, I, yeah, yeah. But that I, no, gets me a bit angry, that actually. No, I see, I see, because, you know, you've got actual experience of being there and sort of and seeing it and, and so on and... and mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I know. I I understand. And that doesn't mean the the French government doesn't try and, and and interfere, but it's much harder for them to because we have safeguards, we have checks and balances, we have recourses to, to 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 defend our rights, which are inscribed in the constitution. There's a system in place. Mm. Mm-hmm. 
These are all very important things and things that should be protected as well, of course. There's, you know, things we have to remember that we that we have. Um, anyway, but just, you know, Chinese, I've got Chinese listeners. I've got plenty of Chinese listeners. Well, I'm very, you know, let me know what, what you hear back, you know. I, I, yes, yeah. it'll be interesting to get responses from them. I wonder what, how some people will respond. But uh, again, I, I really loved it. And yeah. I, I, I had a great time there. But I think I have to be honest about my experience there as a reporter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and I think I think I was pretty fair as a reporter. I think I, I you know I covered some positive stories that describe that you know that that show the country in a good light. I mean that's not the point of the journalist. It's not having a positive negative uh, stories. The point is to tell the truth. Mm, mm -hmm. um, so, and the truth is complicated. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, right. I don't know quite know where to go from here. <laughs> we got to this serious point, but that's all right. You know, that's fine. Thanks a lot for coming on the show. Thank you Charles. for having me. Um, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna continue the conversation, but we're gonna stop re the recording now. But we're gonna we're gonna now talk about um, this is just this is gonna be off the record. <laughs> but we're we're gonna discuss doing some comedy together. Mm -hmm. We're considering uh, doing a sort of thirty minute thirty minute show. A sort of two-man show, but not on the stage at the same time. So no. I'll do, you know, one of us will do 30 minutes, the other one will do 30 minutes. I'm thinking, I'm wondering as well if I can also maybe turn this into some sort of live podcasting opportunity. Mm. If we're going to get a venue together mm. to do some comedy, that I could maybe also use that chance to, after the comedy, do a, a podcast recording of some I kind. I think that'd be great. Because, uh, you know, I like to do that sometimes, do live podcasting. It can be really good fun. It's just a question of finding is finding the right place and time. But anyway, listeners, you can listen out for announcements about that. Mm -hmm. if, you know when, if and when we organise it. Maybe when this is published, it's already been, we've already set it up and stuff. We just need to find a venue, yeah. And then we need to like get some uh, get an audience of people together. <laughs> uh, but that could be fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, Charles, thanks a lot for coming. It's been great to have you here. Well, thank you so much for having me on. And uh, yeah. Uh, can I, uh, if you, if people want to follow what I do? Yeah, yeah, yeah? of course. Yeah, please. Uh, you can follow me on, uh, on Twitter, sorry, on X now, unfortunately. Um, uh, my, uh, you can look up, look up Charles Pilgrim, but my handle is uh, CH, as in the CH from Charles Pilgrim, as in a pilgrim that goes to different places. Uh, and uh, that's also my handle on Instagram. Uh, that's for my sort of stand up and personal account. And then I also have a, a professional journalistic account that's Charles Pilgrim an f24 uh, on instagram okay i will put links in the description folks so you can check out charles's stuff his serious journalistic stuff the more personal stand-up comedy stuff uh, and charles does lots of stories and things funny things about uh having kids yeah. and uh <laughs> very funny stories so you should check that out that would be good all right nice one charles cheers thanks luke Okay, so that was my conversation with Charles Pellegrin. And, uh, you know, you can leave your comments in the comments section as usual. I'm curious to know, you know, what you thought while you were listening to that. And the stuff at the end where Charles talked about China, I hope that no one is kind of, what, I don't know, I hope no one gets offended or anything. I mean, would they? Could they? Maybe they will. I don't know. I think Charles was just, you know, being truthful about his experience of working there as a journalist but of course you know it's a totally different system isn't it in china a different ideological system and uh you know so there are there are definite differences there anyway you can leave your comments in the comments section can't you and just uh, give your thoughts if you want to um i hope at least you found it interesting to get those insights of what it's like to to work in china from a different perspective um, yeah, all right. Don't forget the comedy show. How could you forget, considering I've been talking about it so often on this podcast, uh, but Friday is the date of the show, and then I won't be mentioning it anymore because it'll be in the past. You know how time works, right? I wouldn't be promoting something that happened in the past. That Yeah, unless you had a time machine, you wouldn't be able to attend, obviously. Oh, dear. Um, but so, yes, 8.30, uh, au soleil de la butte, uh, which is an, a, a phrase uh, 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 that I can't pronounce very well, but it doesn't matter, does it? 
Can you? I don't know. Maybe you can if you're French. Anyway, Au Soleil de la Butte, uh, 32 Rue Muller in the 18th arrondissement of Paris at 8.30. Uh, Charles and I will be doing our show. Charles is doing 30 minutes of stand-up. I'll be doing 30 minutes of stand-up. And if you come down, you can, you know, enjoy the show. And Charles has got some very funny stories about being a dad and about... Um, all sorts of things that has, that have happened to him in his life um, about his uh, his identity and stuff. So you can enjoy that. And I'll be doing thirty minutes of my stuff. I'll be talking about all sorts of different things. Um, so come along, and you can actually see me doing stand up. You can actually see me standing up for a change because if you ever like watch the video versions of these episodes, you just see me sitting down. Standing up is a fairly rare occurrence, isn't it? Happens every now and then. Uh, so you'll, if you want to come and see my legs in operation, then come along and see me doing stand-up comedy and hopefully have a, a bit of a laugh as well as just, you know, enjoying my, my knees doing their job. Um, all right. And yeah, as I said before, I'll be doing a podcast recording in the room afterwards. I've been saying hopefully and I might be doing, you know, I've been saying things like that, but I think it's definitely going to happen. Uh, so the plan will be, yeah, actually the programme... Um, is uh, 7 p.m. there's the open mic night which means that some uh, people will be, will be coming and doing stand-up in English and it's an open mic night so these are people who are kind of like fairly new to stand-up or people who are trying out new material um, I might do I might do some I might do a set at the open mic night uh, we'll see um, and then after that at 8 at 8 30 Charles and I will begin our show We'll probably have someone doing five minutes at the beginning just to kind of say hello and s set up the show. And then either I'll go first or Charles will go first. And then, you know, and then the other one will, will come after. OK, and then there'll be a little interval to give you a chance to get a drink and stuff. And then I'll do my podcast recording in the room. And uh, I won't mind if you have a pizza or something while I'm doing that. I, I won't mind. And I actually don't know what I'm going to do in the podcast recording. I might just do a ramble. Um or I might prepare some stuff. We will see. We'll see what happens. I'll play it by ear, uh, but it'll be good. So come on down if you can. If you can't come, then you'll be able to enjoy the podcast recording. Um, I won't be publishing the 30 minutes of stand-up because, as I've said before, um, you know, for stand-up comedy, I like to try and keep the material unpublished so that I can use it at shows because once something has been published online it's kind of up there and then it you kind of you have to let it go sort of um all right so cool there you go yes now I think the next episode of this podcast will be a rambling episode because I've got you know the way it works um I publish episodes that I prepare and then every now and then I need to kind of have a ramble in order to just deal with stuff like deal with podcast admin uh, deal with a few comments that have come up and also just to talk about things that have been going on for example I haven't been doing episodes about the Euros uh, Euro 2024 although by the time you listen to this the Euros will be finished um, I'm recording this uh, on Wednesday the 10th of July yesterday uh, France got knocked out of the Euros in the semi-finals. They were beaten by Spain. So Spain will be in the final, um, and that's going to be on Sunday. And England are playing the Netherlands this evening at 9 p.m. Uh, Central European time. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, England played against... Um, who did we play against? Switzerland uh, at the weekend. And... Well, we won. We won on penalties. I have to say the penalties were great. We scored all our penalties, and which is a refreshing change because normally England don't do very well in penalty shootouts. And so many times in the past we've been knocked out of international competitions on penalties, but we were really cool with the penalties. And every penalty taker took a great penalty, very, very confident, very cool, very calm, um, and very effective so some great penalties. And our goalkeeper, Jordan Pickford, saved one of the Swiss penalties. So we won uh, and went through. I mean, the performance was a little bit better than... Um, in, you know, England played a bit better than they have done in this tournament so far, um, which is quite promising. Let's see if we can keep that moving and put on a good performance against the Netherlands. Uh, I, I hope 
for England to be in the final, of course, that would be nice. Um, but, I mean, you know, we've been quite lucky, I think, this tournament with the draw, meaning the teams that we've played against as we've gone through. Um, we've been fairly lucky in that regard. The Netherlands are a solid team, of course, so it's going to be a tough game. And uh, if we make it through to the final, we'll, we'll have a big challenge to uh, beat Spain because Spain are very impressive this year. Um, just very... Uh, dynamic, very fast, um, and dangerous as well. So anyway, I'll probably do a rambling episode uh, for the next one if I get the chance, if I have time, because I've got stuff I need to just deal with, just things I want to talk about, like maybe the Euros and, and other things, the comments and stuff that people have sent in that I feel like I need to respond to. Uh, the Rick Thompson report, for example, I don't think we're going to have another one. Um, the election result, uh, the elections happened uh, last week, and the result was exactly as my dad predicted, meaning that the, the Labour Party won uh, by a landslide. Um, and so... Basically, I spoke to my dad this weekend. He said, oh, we, I don't think we need to do another Rick Thompson report. Um, and I didn't press him, you know. I didn't kind of try to persuade him to do it because, you know, he does those podcast episodes as a favour, really. And he's he's basically retired these days. So I don't want to, you know, put too much pressure on him or try and persuade him to do something uh, like that, which is essentially asking him to work for free isn't it so normally i'm fairly sort of um um what's the word for it i'm fairly relaxed about it and i'll mention it i'll say do you fancy doing a rick thompson report and if he's up for it we'll do it but this time he said oh i don't think we need to so i got the impression he probably probably would rather rather not because He's, you know, he's retired. And plus, he's still, even though he's retired, he's busy. He does other things. He's writing his third book and stuff like that. Um, but basically, um, he was right. And the result was as we expected. So we've got a Labour government now. And Keir Starmer is now the Prime Minister. And so the Labour government will have a huge challenge ahead of them to try to, you know, it basically fix a lot of problems in the country. Um, anyway, hopefully I'll, there'll be a rambling episode coming next in which uh, I'll be able to talk about a lot of these things and other stuff. OK, uh, I think I should probably stop talking now because that it feels like the end of the episode. In fact, it is the end of the episode, isn't it? It is. It is. OK, <laughs> speak to you next time then. All right, everyone. Good. Hopefully I'll see some of you at the show on Friday. You can come and say hello and um you know take a selfie with me if you want to because people do that you know when they when i know it's weird i'm like a little bit famous when people meet me they say oh uh, um i listen to your podcast can i take a selfie with you and i'm like yeah okay i feel like a famous person for a moment so anyway that sort of thing might happen on friday so i might see you there in which case i will see you there but for everyone else uh just you know have a great weekend and uh I'll speak to you next time on the podcast, okay? So, for now, I will just say goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.